How these, uh, how these plants have successfully gotten us to do their bidding. Did you realize you are working for the plants in your life? If you brought flowers with you today, you are an agent of evolution. Did you choose to grow the flowers that you brought with you today? Or did you choose to purchase them at a store? If you took either, either of these actions, you're effectively helping to propagate a particular species. Perhaps you brought some dandelions that miraculously appeared in your yard. As you probably know, dandelions have successfully evolved to avoid many human attempts of eradication. <laughs> probably because some animals and humans enjoy dandelions as a food source, they have developed that amazing ability to regenerate themselves from their very long roots. Because of our decisions to choose or avoid various species, we continue to function as agents of change in the great web of life. In The Botany of Desire, Pollen examines our relationship with four species, apples, tulips, marijuana, and potatoes. Apples originated in Central Asia, but because of their potential for sweetness and our desire for sweetness, we have propagated them around the world. In the first part of the 17th century, tulip omania nearly brought the Dutch economy to ruin, and today we continue to cultivate and market the tulip around the world. Concerning marijuana, Today, many individuals risk forfeiting their freedom to grow cannabis for its intoxicating qualities. In 1988, researchers discovered that THC, the intoxicating chemical in cannabis, activates a specific network of receptors in the brain that affect memory, higher order thought, movement, and emotion. Because of this research, in 1992, Raphael Mechelam and William Devane discovered the brain's own version of THC and called it anandamine, from the Sanskrit word for inner bliss. Conceivably, cannabis produces THC to discombobulate the insects and higher herbivores that prey on the plant. For example, it might make a bug or a rabbit forget what it's doing or where in the world it last saw that tasty plant. <laughs> However, others believe that the psychoactive properties which attracted human attention caused the plant to be spread around the world. Although potatoes were first domesticated 8,000 years ago in Peru, because of their vitality as a food source, Spanish explorers brought them back to Europe. Because potatoes could thrive in colder climates and poor soil, they were instrumental in growing the population of northern Europe and helped, helped move the cultural center of the world from the Mediterranean to Central and Northern Europe. When the Irish were decimated by the potato famine in 1845, many fled to the New World and brought potatoes with them. So from the Old World to the, from the New World to the Old World and back to the New World. 125 to 100 million years ago, flowers evolved on our planet in the form of angiosperms. 
This significant evolutionary event allowed plants to evolve more quickly. By developing flowers and fruit, these angiosperms, flowers, were able to attract pollinators in the form of insects and protect their seeds with fruits. At the same time, many modern insects appeared, so today we can see from the fossil record how flowers and insects have co-evolved. Michael Pollan points out that like bees, we also work for the flowers. Interestingly, we have a lot in common with bees. Like bees, we are attracted to symmetry, patterns, fragrances, shape, color, and scents. Why do things bees find attractive do we also find attractive? Based on their research, Florian Scheistel and Stephen Johnson write that the flowers of most plant species contain a food reward for their pollinators in order to encourage loyalty. But these insects are also frequently tricked into believing that flowers are a food source when they are in fact completely unrewarding. This form of deception is particularly common among orchids. There are about 25,000 species in the orchid family, and it has been estimated that around 40% of these species offer no rewards for their pollinators. Many have wondered why plants would benefit from cheating rather than rewarding their pollinators. One suggestion is that the lack of rewards discourages pollinators from lingering for too long on any one plant and thus encourages cross-pollination. <coughs> in order to attract insects, flowers have developed elaborate deceptions. Some of these deceptions include posing as dead animals, as receptive female wasps, or even as wounded bees. The greatest deception occurs when flowers emit certain signals, often chemical, that trick pollinators into believing that the flowers are mating partners or sites to lay eggs. For example, flower heads of one Asian, daisy uh, one Asian daisy species are even decorated with raised dark spots, giving sex-starved male insects the impression that flower heads are occupied by a whole bevy of resting female insects. Ooh la la. The tremendous diversity of flowers and plant families, such as orchids, arums, and milkweeds, is in part due to the variety of different strategies that have evolved to deceive insect pollinators. In her poem, Writing Poems, Mary Oliver draws our attention to the relationship among bees and flowers. But it also has us reflect on our own interactions with each other and how we search for beauty in our world. This morning, I watched the pale green cones of the rhododendrons opening their small pink and red blouses. The bodies of the flowers were instantly beautiful to the bees. They hurried out of that dark place in the thick tree, one after another, an invisible line upon which their iridescence caught fire as the sun caught them sliding down. Is there anything more important than hunger and happiness? Each bee entered the frills of a flower to find the sticky fountain, as if, as if some dust spilled on the walkways of the petals and caught onto their bodies. I don't know. If bees that otherwise death is everywhere, even in the red swamp of a flower, but they did this. With no small amount of desperation, you might say, love. And the flowers, as daft as mud, poured out their honey. I think Mary Oliver saw herself, and perhaps other humans, as bees that are enamored by flowers, or poetry, or art, or beauty, or beauty. For we are drawn to the beautiful in our world, because it connects us to something greater than ourselves. We seek out the beauty in the world and the beauty in each other. As I look out at everyone in this room, I see each of you as a beautiful individual, a room full of beautiful flowers, you might say, perfect just the way you are. Yes, an entire bouquet. You are a unique and beautiful individual. 
You alone can contribute your talents and skills to make our world a better place. Let us not forget to take time to listen to each other, share a smile, or a warm greeting. You can be a friend in a world that needs to be friendlier, more loving, and more compassionate. Thank you for being you. Bless these flowers, for like each of us, each is beautiful. Bless, Bless these, these flowers. flowers. Bless these flowers, for like each of us, each is unique. Bless, Bless these, these flowers. flowers. Bless these flowers, for each reflects a unique spectrum of light. Bless, Bless these flowers. Bless these flowers, for each has its own unique shape and texture. Bless, Bless these, these flowers. flowers. Bless these flowers, for each has its own fragrance like no other. Bless, Bless these flowers. Blessed be. Thank you. This morning, carefully choose a flower that you did not bring with you today. The flower represents another person. As Unitarian Universalists, we dearly hold the inherent worth and dignity of every person in our minds and hearts. And we accept one another, encourage each other in our spiritual quest for truth and meaning. When you select a flower, think carefully about who your flower may represent. I encourage you to pray or reflect upon this spiritual practice. 